Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gordon Andrew Fletcher, and I have the priv privilege of serving as uh, adjunct professor here at American University in the School of Public Affairs, uh, teaching criminal justice and public policy. We have an amazing event for you all this afternoon. Um, we're going to be talking about gentrification in the District of Columbia, as well as our criminal justice system. Our panelists are amazing experts, community leaders um, that derive right here in the District of Columbia. Um, they have a lot of experience around this topic. Um, and so I want to make sure that I do them justice and I'll have them all introduce themselves momentarily. Um, my name again is Gordon Fletcher. I am a professor, adjunct professor at American University. Uh, I am also a lawyer and an elected official in the District of Columbia, and I'm a proud member of the AU community. Uh, I serve as the immediate past chair of the Black Alumni Alliance, and everything and anything regarding AU, I support. Um, so at this time, I'm going to ask our panelists uh, to turn their cameras on. That way we can introduce, or you can introduce yourselves individually. Um, first, um, I would like to give the floor to Parisa, uh, Director of Empower DC, uh, to introduce yourself, ma'am. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. My name is Parisa Noruzi. I'm the co-founder of Empower DC. Um, we started the organization in 2003. We're a citywide organization uh, involved in community organizing and building power, particularly with lower income black and brown communities to stop displacement, to bring about environmental justice and equitable development. We're multi-issue, so maybe we'll get a chance to talk about that more later, but I'm very proud to be with my colleagues here today. Thank you for having me again. Absolutely, thank you for being here. You know, Empower DC does amazing work on behalf of some of our most vulnerable residents and many black and brown residents in the District of Columbia. So thank you for everything that your organization does uh, here in DC. Uh, next, I would like to introduce, uh, you know, somebody that I look up to a lot and in the class I teach at AU, uh, a lot of my students, they, they have enjoyed reading his book and enjoyed him being a guest lecturer. Well, they both have, but I'm going to <laughs> they both have. AU has been fortunate enough to have some really stellar uh, community leaders and just authors and just amazing people. Um, so next up, we're going to have Tony Lewis Jr. Um, introduce himself. Tony, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Gordon. Hello, everyone. I'm Tony Lewis Jr., um, author, activist, advocate, um, working in the spaces of mass incarceration, violence intervention, um, gentrification, and uh, opportunity access for DC natives. I'm honored to be here uh, to sit on this illustrious panel with people that I respect. Thank you, Gordon, for hosting this important conversation. Absolutely. And thank you for being here. You know, I think any conversation around gentrification, the criminal justice system, if it doesn't have Tony Lewis Jr. there or, you know, involved or somehow some way, it's just not a real DC conversation. So thank you for being here. Um, uh, next up, we have uh, George Derek Musgrove. Uh, you know, he's been amazing author, professor, a historian. And so I just want to thank him for all of his work and regarding everything and anything DC related. Uh, he's a wealth of knowledge. And so I want to give him the chance to introduce himself at this time. Mr. Musgrove, you have the floor. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, name is George Derek Musgrove. I'm a professor of history at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and the author, co-author of Chocolate City and the author of uh, Black Power in Washington, DC, a website exploring Black Power activism in the city. Uh, and I'm just really excited to be in conversation with Parisa and with Tony, uh, who I tremendously admire and as a researcher have to sit back and learn from because they know what's going on and I just want to write it up. Uh, so thanks, Gordon, for getting us all together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is great. And last but certainly not least, uh, Sharice Crawford, uh, at large committee woman for the D.C. Democratic Party. Um, Sharice is also a friend and a colleague, and so Sharice, you have the floor to introduce yourself. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. I'm going to make sure the audio is good. Uh, so great to be here with you at American University. Uh, great to be here at uh, Public School of Public Affairs. Uh, great to be here with you, Gordon, George, Tony, and Parisa. 
Um, I think we have Ms. Chanel that's helping us to moderate. My name is Sharice Crawford, uh, third generation native Washingtonian. My grandmother actually grew up in my maternal grandmother in Langston Terrace, Ward 5, which is one of the country's most historic housing, uh, uh, historic housing dwellings in the country. Uh, my paternal grandmother grew up in a housing complex east of the river in Ward 8, which was formerly known as Condon Terrace. That's where she raised my father and his siblings. And so my uh, history with uh, that housing complexes here in the District of Columbia and how they've been uh, revamped and many of those residents, predominantly Black, moved out of the District of Columbia. Uh, another one of those areas is Berry Farm, where my, my, my godmother and my god sisters lived as we grew up uh, in those housing dwellings. And my housing dwelling was the Congress Park community, which is now known as Last of the Mohegan when it comes to um, organized community complexes that are impacted by gentrification, um, houses that are uh, subsidized housing, which I prefer to call them secure housing. And I think this conversation is going to lead us in the direction of how do we maintain historic uh, communities? I think uh, the Hanover is one of those communities where Mr. Tony Lewis is from. I think maintaining the historic dwellings, you all are gonna help us, the students at American University are gonna help us create the strong policies to support the residents that are here now, but also to honor the residents that um, came before us and did not have this opportunity who did not have this voice. And so that's my role here um, with the Democratic State Committee. Some of the things that we've done about historic land preservation, uh, which is some policies that we've worked on. And now wanting to, as I transition to DC Council, we'll love to have you all work with us um, to make a big impact. And so I'm happy to be here and want to transition back over to you, Mr. Fletcher. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you all of our panelists. Uh, we're going to have a very good discussion, just some housekeeping matters. Uh, first, I want to make sure that I recognize and acknowledge uh, the Dean of the School of Public Affairs, Dean Vicki Wilkins, for her support always with making sure that we have panels such as these, events such as these, and also the chair of the Justice Law and Criminology Department, uh, Bill Davies. I uh, just want to thank both of them for their support, uh, for making sure that this uh, event um, happens. Um, next, I want to make sure that um, we have some other housekeeping matters in order. Uh, first, uh, those who have any questions or concerns, please uh, navigate or direct those questions to the Q&A um, on this webinar. I want to make sure that we're answering questions from folks um, as they come in. Uh, next, we're going to have about 30, 45 minutes of conversations, and then we're going to have about 15 or so minutes of Q&A. Um, and so I have my pen and paper here because I know I'm going to take some notes because I know I'm going to hear some really meaningful and positive information. Um, so just like on CNN, we're going to get into it. All right, right. And so let's let's start um, right now. I want to start just with a broad question around gentrification, right? You know, as something that we all know has been occurring in in the District of Columbia for many years, and um, we're seeing uh, a very strong change. You know, the title of this um, event is Cappuccino City. And uh, the reason for that, I know for our native Washingtonians, um, you know, I've been here since I'm 17, but I'm not a native like Sharice and Tony. I know that word Cappuccino City kind of kind of touches you differently because DC was always known as Chocolate City. So if we could, you know, talk broad there first, and I would direct this question first to Tony and Sharice, how do you feel about the name um, Cappuccino City, the fact that we've gone from Chocolate City when DC was close to 80% Black to a place where we are now where DC is maybe about 45, 45.5% um, Black at this time. So let's start there to the panelists. Oh, I guess, I, I guess. Uh, yeah, Tony, yes. Yes. Want me to go first? Okay. Yes, um, well, I mean, that's that's definitely a broad question. I, obviously, uh, the term cappuccino city, uh, as you mentioned, is something that um, it doesn't necessarily feel good to us native Washingtonians. Um, you know, you've seen this mass exodus of African-American residents. Uh, and, and particularly, like when you look at P 
people from here, right? DC has always been a transient place, right? People didn't just start arriving. I think you're breaking up. Is it just Emma? Can you guys hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Um, we we, we talking about uh, you know DC has always been a transient place, um, but but with the, the 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 new sort of dynamic is that those that have been born and raised here, because uh, people continue to move here, right? Of all, all races, all cultures, um, DC has become so cosmopolitan. That's not a bad thing, but the people that are uh, sort of native to this city um, have left, um, and so. You know, growing up in, in, in a community like mine where that was 100% African-American and now seeing it almost turned in the opposite direction. And I think the volume and the speed of the change and also for me, all of the things that play a part in causing that change, right? I think that's what I hope this conversation sort of, um, you know, uh, unearths as it relates to the intersectionality of the criminal justice system, the education system, um, the, the training or vocational system or their failures to the native Washingtonian or the African-Americans that were born in this city and how that contributes to really the, this mass exodus, not to mention, um, you know, drug addiction also. All of those things have played a role in the destabilization of uh, such a bustling, strong community and, um, you know, and access to certain economic opportunities, pathways to city and federal government jobs things that had, were the bedrock of uh, sort of a couple of generations prior to that allow uh, black home ownership that stabilize homes and things of that nature. So uh, as those things in my time, I'm 41 years old, um, DC was I think 70% black in 1980 when I was born. And now you just spoke to the, the significant drop in the black population. Um, and then of that population, I would, you know, uh, I'll, 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 I'll defer to, uh, to Derek on this, but I, I would, I would, I would, you know, think that the the native population probably is, I don't know, twenty percent of the city's overall population. Uh, so again, um, I think that's how we've gotten to this place of uh, being cappuccino, uh, cappuccino city, um, and you know where other people come here for all of the opportunities and the, and the progression that's happening, and the people born here can't seem to. Um, get their footing. So, yeah. Thank you for that, Tony. Thank you for those words. Uh, Sharice, uh, um, I'm glad that you got back and internet is working. Uh, you know, comments around the change of, you know, from Chocolate City to Cappuccino City for you as a third generation Washingtonian. Yeah, I'm glad you asked the question. Um, I'm, and I missed some of Tony's points, but I came back in right in time. Uh, I think one of the things that started to happen with seniors who owned properties in the District of Columbia, they were taxed, they began to be taxed out. And some of those families were not able to deed their families' properties to their children. They were forced to sell and go into probate. And what that means is that the, the property then would go back to the state, go back rather to the District of Columbia. And now the city now owns that property once the senior um, transitions and is no longer um, here with us. And so some of the things that we started to see as a trend that we could not protect as it started to happen was how do we protect grandma's deed? How do we make sure that no part of the city was owned or, or had still had ownership, whether it be taxes or, or a mortgage, still had any amount of money owed back to the District of Columbia because they then began to, to reclaim those properties and go into probate um, going to the to back to the state and their heirs were not able to keep those homes. So that was another thing that needed to that we needed to address. Then we saw housing communities um, decline. One of the policies that kept families fathers literally out of the home was that if you were receiving some type of government subsidy, you could not have a father in the home. So that meant that children were raised in the city and other parts of the country without the father in their home simply because their mother were, were, was a recipient of some type of government subsidy. And what ended up happening was many of the mothers were not able to sustain that um, and grow a family um, under those conditions. And so that's one of the things I just admire about Tony, just being able to still raise and maintain his family here. Another thing that we saw happen was that once people could afford kind of you know more home value, they wanted more for their dollar. 
You know, they, we didn't have the housing structure here for those who began to grow into economics and they began to um, financially be do well. They started to look for, you know, they wanted the yard, they wanted the, the, the community space for their family to grow. And we were not creating that capacity at the right price point, which we'll see, which we see to this present date. So families were moving out into, you know, what they call now Ward 9, um, into the suburbs of the District of Columbia because it was more affordable and they had more access to land. Um, so what we see now in the District of Columbia is not only Cappuccino City, but a staggering wealth gap. We're talking about something $200,000 compared to less than $40,000 income streams. So where are those people going to live if we're not making affordable income at the, at the lowest area medium income while we still have students moving here to receive education, more people are moving here to participate in the political process. How do we then protect our most vulnerable residents um, like families that grew up with mine in affordable housing, how do we protect affordable housing and truly make it secure housing? Um, something that I really respect about the work that Empower DC um, is really working hard to do. Um, so we really need strong protections on our tax laws. Uh, I know that there's a recent opportunity for seniors to get their taxes cut in half here in the district, but we need to do better than that. Um, I see that we have not really done a great enough job with making sure that the generation that's my generation coming home from college, we're not only taking care of the, the generation before us or the generations before us, but we're now trying to create pathways for those coming behind us. And so that is why I think that the students at American University have the greatest opportunity to say, we are here as students and educators, but not only do we wanna live here, we wanna support and build with the people who live here so that they can maintain some sense of ownership. I think what they did with the cooperative agreements came far too late before people ever had an opportunity to participate. Um, now, cooperatives allow you to live in place and have some sense of ownership in your community. We have to really vamp up, ramp up on that program um, and make it accessible to people who may not be aware that these types of resources exist. And so that's what's happening. I think the wealth gap, um, the economic wealth gap really push a challenge people to stay here. Um, so those that are here need those opportunities too. Deep, um, you know, thank you. You know, I think some of the things you touched upon, I've seen just in my work and in my involvement around the District of Columbia, you know, talking about probates and the fact that we have a lot of families who lose their homes um, through probate because a lot of, you know, our black and brown families do not understand or don't know how to go through estate planning, you know, and then they lose the homes and, you know, it, 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 those homes then get sold to somebody that's not a native Washingtonian and just being a straight shooter. A lot of times a new Washingtonian, a new resident is not somebody that's black and brown just because of the price points of homes. So a lot of things you touch upon spot on. Thank you for those comments. Um, Parisa, then, then, then Derek, you know, uh, comments uh, regarding what Tony and Sharice talked about um, as native Washingtonians, you know, you know, it being Chocolate City and now being Cappuccino City. Uh, some of your comments, your thoughts around that based on what you heard them say. I uh, will go with Parisa and then and then you, uh, Derek. Yeah, um, you know, I respect every word that they said. I've, I moved into the city the summer of 2000 when I finished college. And um, just in that short time, in that 21 years, of course, I've seen the city, um, you know, go through this massive, um, saying that there's been changes is not a significant enough description because it's really been uprooting and um, destroying culture and community and uh, families as as Sharice and, and Tony talked about. Everything that I know, you know, is from just working with our members, many of whom are multi-generational um, DC residents. And what you find is that this has been a, a ongoing displacement is something that several generations of Washingtonians have experienced. So while people were being displaced from Berry Farm, their parents or grandparents were displaced from Southwest and, and those were displaced pr prior to that from Georgetown. And so it's just been an ongoing thing. And I, I think one thing that um, sometimes we fail to, to recognize is that it's driven by policy. It's driven by government policy. 
where are we putting our money as a city? Uh, who are we allowing access to land? Um, one thing that, that seemed to be a real trigger point is after the control board era, the city was really selling off public land. Well, not even selling it, giving away, giving it away. public land to developers for pennies on the dollar to build market or luxury housing. And, and still today, the bulk of what the city subsidizes is actually expensive housing. It's not affordable housing. Even if they call it affordable, it's not affordable. Um, so uh, it is a policy decision to destabilize the communities as Tony was talking about. Think about the policy decision of closing 40 black schools in about 10 years time. That's what we did. The schools were the center of community. They were the place where generation after generation came and got educated. And the fact that we closed schools that were solely educating black students and serving black families. And then we gave that land away basically to either charter schools or to developers. Um, this was all, you know, part of the, and of course, Cherise spoke about the demolition of public housing. We can't forget Hope Six, followed by the city's own programs, New Communities Initiative, um, which corresponded directly with the spike in family homelessness. So we were demolishing the only uh, housing that was affordable to low-income families and uh, creating, you know, homelessness among, among those families. And so, Again, it, it's, a, it's, it's policy driven and it comes from the top down. Unfortunately, our last several mayors have been greedy of gentrification. They love it. They love the gentrification. They don't wanna stop the gentrification at all costs. And, and that's what we've seen. We don't wanna put any, as a city, we don't put any breaks. We don't put any you know, real safeguards to make sure that we're uplifting the people who've been here, to make sure that we're not displacing the people who've been here. And we can have improvements too, but let's make sure we're protecting people first. And, and we fail to do that as a city. No, thank you for that. Thank you. And, and Derek, uh, please, you next. And, and as you uh, answer these questions and give your remarks, you know, one thing that Prisa did say, I would like you just to expound upon a little bit as well and opine on is why is DC not stopping the gentrification, right? Mm -hmm. What's, you know, what is, What's the reason behind that as well? Um, and I know you've done a lot of research on this topic, so please, you have the floor now. Yeah, well, well thank you for the, the question, uh, Gordon, because uh, Parisa, Tony, and, and Sharice had already answered the, the previous ones, and so I'm right. glad you threw me a bone there. Right. <laughs> um, so, so let me just let me just jump back and say that I, I really love, and we should thank Derek Hira for the formulation Cappuccino City, which is, of course, the topic of his book. Um, and, and I, I love the term because it's it's very descriptive, right? Cappuccinos are expensive, which is DC today. They also have a lot of white foam on top of a relatively small amount of espresso at the bottom. Uh, and so they really are descriptive of this moment in the city's history. Um, you know, right before Derek uh, put together that title, uh, Andrew Lightman, who was the editor of, of Hillrag uh, newspaper, had come up with the term Latte City. And he was sort of playing off of uh, the old Chocolate City name, uh, you know, broadcast to the world by Parliament Funkadelic. And I think that Cappuccino works better with, with total, total respect to Andrew. Uh, Derek, I think, got it right. Um, now, look, I mean, cities generally in Washington, D.C. in particular, have always had pretty significant population shifts. Um, the city exploded in size during the Civil War, exploded in size during World War II, did it again in uh, uh, World War I as well. Uh, and then, of course, you had the huge racial musical chairs of the 1950s and 60s, where you had about 200,000 Black people move into the city and about 300,000 white people move out. Um, and I think it's really important to remember in saying that what Parisa so wonderfully laid out, which is that um, it's not like people just come and go and it's totally absent any regulation or, or, or inducements from government. Um, oftentimes, uh, the population swings in the city are the product uh, uh, of public policy or are shaped by public policy. And so, of course, the bulk of our conversation, I think, after this has to, to, to get to what were those policies, what was their purpose? I'll just deal with the, the one question that you raised uh, and directed at me, Gordon, and that is that, you know, the city needed gentrification in the first 
two decades of the um, 21st century because it was broke. I mean, remember, we go bankrupt in 1994. We have a $700 million um, uh, deficit. And, and part of that is because Congress refused to, to increase the federal payment uh, pretty much the entire time that Marion Barry was in office. Uh, they did immediately as soon as he was, uh, uh, um, as soon as he didn't run again uh, in, um, uh, God, when, when, when Sharon Pratt Kelly replaced him. So that was um, 19, 1990, right? Um, uh, they essentially give the city a bailout almost as soon as she gets into office. Um, but, you know, we needed rich people to come back to the city. Uh, and, you know, Tony Williams did a study in 2002 uh, that laid out, they, and they gave it to him, and then he held a press conference announcing it. We have to have middle class people and rich people come back to the city. Why? Because we don't have a lot of land that we can tax. Roughly half of our land is owned by churches, universities, and the federal government. We can't tax it. Um, and uh, for much of the time that we're, we're bankrupt in the first 10 years of the 20th century, a majority of the high paid white collar workers downtown lived in the suburbs. Um, and so we weren't able to tax roughly half of the income generated in the city. And of course, Congress actually bans us from uh, uh, taxing the income of people who live out this, uh, outside the city. Um, so we needed to pe bring people back into the city and then to tax them, right? Now, I think what Parisa also hinted at and, and didn't, you know, she, she didn't sort of eat up too much time because she was giving it some to, to the rest of us, is that the city could have put in place another set of public policies uh, that protected poor people, but they chose not to, right? And so, so we have a very specific conversation that we can have about how the city is attracting all these rich people back. And they had to, we had to get back into the black when it came to our budget, right? But at the same time, they decided not to protect the poor people that were here when market forces were going to sort of wash them out of the city uh, if, if, if everything the city planned, in fact, happened. Awesome. Thank you so much. And, and with the time, because the time is going in this conversation we're getting into it now even deeper, I want to shift a little bit to uh, criminal justice as well. Um, so when we talk about criminal justice, you know, and for those that do not know, um, anyone that's incarcerated for a felony, because DC is not a state, uh, those individuals are sent to um, prisons all over the country. You know, some as far as uh, Bakersville, California, Cumberland, Maryland, and everywhere in between. And so when we, when those individuals have completed their, their time and they have to return, returning citizens, are we taking care of our returning citizens? Are we preparing our returning citizens? Um, you know, of those returning citizens, about 45, 50% are under, are under the age of 35. That means there's a lot of life to be lived and are we preparing them and giving them the tools to do so? Um, I know housing is a very important part of uh, stability. And so, you know, I wanna go to our, one of our criminal justice experts, uh, Mr. Lewis. You know, how do, in your opinion, in your research and your, you know, all your work, are we taking care of our returning citizens properly in the District of Columbia? And if not, what could we do to protect them and provide them with more resources and opportunities? Well, thanks for that question, Gordon. And, and I would say, uh, you know, we don't have the autonomy to do as much as we would want to, right? Uh, our residents serve their time, as you stated, in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Um, and we don't have influence there to say what kind of education and vocational training they should get in order to be competitive when they return to the community. Um, I would say DC probably has the most robust reentry infrastructure out of any city or state in America, but we have to because we can't do anything in terms of the influence what I just spoke to when they are incarcerated. Um, the other part of this, uh, as we mentioned, uh, the, the, how policy has impacted gentrification policy obviously impacts uh, what happens in reentry. Uh, DC has a knowledge-based job market and most of the industries here, the bustling growing industries here are what I would consider to be anti-return citizen. 
and that needs to be some tremendous amount of work done uh, on the front of changing hiring policies and uh, allowing for record stealing. Um, you know, uh, we, we can't expunge any felonies here in the District of Columbia. So when you look at that, you look at the high propensity of criminal involvement or justice involvement, particularly in the uh, Native Black community, uh, which probably represents uh, 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 in maybe the 96 percentile of those that are incarcerated, the Black people from D.C. Um, and you think about the how that limits earn earning potential. Um, Cherie spoke to uh, sort of the, the income gap. And if you have in said communities um, the where criminal involvement or justice involvement has been so normalized and so frequent that people returning in the age group that you spoke to can't get jobs that's going to allow them to be able to afford market housing here, right? They cannot necessarily work at the bank or at the hospital or at the law firm or in the IT sector, uh, they, you know, city government, certain agencies. So it's barriers there. Um, and that has uh, catastrophic effects uh, on them, their families and their communities. And so we got a ton of work to do as it relates to that. Um, I think if we're able to really, you know, uh, from a policy standpoint, uh, allow for right, full rights restoration allow for people to be able to work where they want, um, to earn a certain living where they can live where they want. Uh, I think our issues with public safety, our issues with education, our issues with family stabilization, a lot of those things could be addressed. And sometimes we talk about these things as if um, they are islands onto themselves, right? Uh, but they're not, they're so interconnected and particularly in the black community, we, when we look at victims of violent crime, when we look at people that are full insecure, when we look at those that are homeless, when we look at those that I just spoke to that are incarcerated, when you break that down by race, there's almost no representation of white people there, right? And even, even for our brown brothers and sisters, as when you look across the country, the representation for uh, the Latinx population is, is very minimal uh, based on other cities. And so you see, you know, these issues or these challenges in our city being represented, um, you know, almost fully by black folk and it's not even statistically comparable. And what, but how does that, you know, so when we look at the displacement, um, when we look at uh, the issues facing this particular community, um, and you see that even we, we, we have such a unique incarceration experience that our, our residents don't, they do their time abroad, and I can go on forever talking about the impacts of that from a familiar standpoint, but they even return abroad. So we don't even have a halfway house in the District of Columbia. So people don't even release back so, so to the city. They release in Baltimore or Wilmington, Delaware. And the, that handicaps the reentry process uh, from the beginning. So we have a lot, to, a lot of work to do, um, but I, I do wanna take this opportunity just to talk about very briefly um, we have a lot of organizations that, that do a tremendous amount of work, people that are members of the Reentry Action Network, organizations like NARC, um, organizations like the National Reentry Network, uh, uh, MORCA. We got a lot of things going on in this city, um, in, in, in from a, even from a political standpoint. Um, our incarcerated residents can even participate in our elections. So those are the kind of things that I'm ex extremely proud of. But uh, until that's one of the things, even in the statehood conversation that comes up or that's been coming up, you never hear people really talk about that we would get our prisons back. And I'm, right. I'm dismayed by that sometimes because I feel like that to me, that should be something that um, we, we champion. But we don't even mention that. But that would be a benefit to statehood because then we could uh, control and influence the kind of training and rehabilitation and interventions um, and readiness that our incarcerated uh, men and women receive. So when they come back to us, they will be prepared to assimilate and thrive in, in, in the District of Columbia. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, I know we lost that right. We lost that right in uh, 1997 because the National Capitalization Re Revitalization Act. And so Sharice. Correct. Uh, yeah, so, and, and I, I, Tony, that's one of the big things. And, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit after if we have some time, but you know, another thing, the fact that we weren't able to even defend ourselves on January 6th 
Um, so there's just so many implications around that. That's like a whole subject and topic and event on this. Right. So yeah, thank you for bringing it up just for everyone on, on the Zoom call right now, the webinar. Sharice, yes, you have a comment, please. Absolutely. You know, Tony just spoke very high level um, to the current challenges of the returning citizen. And I think we just have to address how we created the prison to the, the, the education to prison pipeline. We have to address the mandatory minimum sentences. How right now people are still carrying records from marijuana, which was a politically made up term, where now people are capitalizing at the highest level from the cannabis industry, which was not long ago considered a level, what, level one drug, if I'm not mistaken. So these are the types of things that we were criminalized for char and received 10 times, three to, three to four hot times higher uh, prison sentences around than our white counterparts is particularly in my community. So we have to reconcile for those types of penalties. Um, and what I mean by we created the, the, the education to prison pipeline because it was about economics. And if you look right now, when we talk about the, the other states receiving our prisoners, they're also receiving their federal dollars. So every prisoner is representing a reflective of a, a certain dollar amount of a stakeholder in that particular jurisdiction. So not only are our individual bodies going there, but so are our federal dollars going to follow those prisoners. So how do we get here? How do we create a system where one, you have policies that says that if you are a woman receiving federal assistance or any government subsidy of her own housing, that you could not have a male in the home, one. And then two, we started to take things like trades out of the schools. If you look at the curriculum right now, the 2021 curriculum, things like finance, there's one school in the District of Columbia that has finance as a specialized trade in the entire DC public school system. I went to meet with local five plumbers. They're now in, in the state of Maryland because well, we can't house them here in DC, but two, they said, we've been looking to hire more plumbers to get them in our apprentice. And DC is not helping us produce enough of those high school students. This is happening right now um, where we're failing consistently. And so what happens is we're not creating economic opportunities early enough for kids who were in my age, you know, my day, I was about 13 years old when I first started working. Kids then, they were looking for, they were the head of households at 11 years old. So what's happening now is that this is a, a, a returning, a, a repeating cycle. So when kids are looking for fast income, they're looking for ways that they can feed their families. They're turning to the street and legal activity, which we've now legalized and begin to capitalize on. So until we start getting real about making sure that cannabis is, 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 is equal opportunity employment, equal opportunity business opportunity, and we're not looking to tax people $2,000, $3,000 to start a license in the cannabis industry, one of the things I was able to do um, as a former advisor neighborhood commissioner was vote on behalf and in favor of the very first um, women-owned cannabis industry, a dispensary in Anacostia, east of the river. There are only, and, she, and there are only two of them in the District of Columbia. And who suffered the greatest when you look at marijuana laws and, mar and marijuana policies that still to this day have not been able to get records expunged to get a fair shot in employment? So these are things that I encourage. I look forward to all of American University students working with us on as we put one vocational education, not just back into high school, but in middle school. OK, showing kids economic opportunities start earlier on in the process, getting them the math, getting them the math uh, uh, assessments early on so they can start preparing for these types of trades so they can feed their families. And Absolutely. then two, making sure that cannabis is equal employment opportunity, but also equal business opportunity. Absolutely. Great points. And one of the things you touched upon when you're talking about the criminal justice system, we're talking about our youth, I support hands down. We need more vocational opportunities. We need more mentorship. We need more social services, mental health programs, all of those things for our young people, especially dealing with anything around the criminal justice system. But to Derek and Parisa, um, you know, a question about police presence, uh, police presence in schools, right? You know, our, our black and brown schools, our black and brown students, um, you know, they make up about 68% or so of our population in education. However, they are arrested at about 
um, not about a 98% rate. And so there's disparity there. So I just wanna get some of your comments and thoughts around police presence in schools. Do we need that? Do we not? Um, and if we don't, you know, what do we need to keep our students safe and also make sure that they're not getting into the, the criminal justice system, um, especially while they're, you know, at that age? So Parisa, uh, you first and, and then Derek, please. Well, I would, you know, say that organizations that work with black youth in the schools, like Black Swan Academy, have come out against police in schools. So I would listen to the youth and see what they want, you know, in their schools and what they think is most helpful. And I know that um, Sharice was talking about trades, but I think just having opportunity, right? Um, Liz Davis, the um, the president of the teachers union, rest in peace, uh, used to say, it's not an achievement gap, it's an opportunity gap, right? And, and it's true that it, what I've witnessed is that kids have often a very small bubble of that they're exposed to, you know, so when I've worked in Ivy City for many years, and it's, it's almost rare for some of the young people to get out of the neighborhood, you know, even just to see what else DC has to offer, not much less get out of the city, right? So I think it, and, and, you know, if you come from a more privileged background, it, it's, of course, you're going to have after school classes, you're going to go to summer camp, you know, you're going to be, ex you're going to get to travel, you're going to get exposed to these things. And, and we have to understand that um, life becomes very limited, and it's hard to see your future. If you are, you know, uh, excluded from all of these opportunities. And also, if you grow up uh, in a city that doesn't make you feel uh, respected and loved and cared for. And if you're seeing your family struggle to maintain housing, maintain employment, you know, eat, if you're seeing all the development coming up around you doesn't reflect you at all. In fact, it's displacing the people, the, the people in the places that you've known and loved. How can you feel loved by your city? And so I think to read to, to Sharice's point, you know, you're giving kids the option of a minimum wage job or, your, or go to the street, at least in their community, and earn more on a, their own schedule, you know, and it may be illegal, it may not be the best choice, but you can understand why that is seen as a, as a, a favorable alternative to working in some dead-end job for minimum wage. So we have to give people more opportunity and exposure um, and we have to care about them in order to do that. You know, it's not always gonna be like, uh, let me, you know, uh, it, we're going to have to meet people where they are at is, is I guess what I'm trying to say. And, and um, you know, I think the biggest lesson about young people is they're not going to care what you have to say until they believe that you care about them. Right. And that is going to take some proving, you know, and I don't know. I mean, some schools may have the teachers that are proving that and have the administration that's proving it, but I'm not sure we have that across the board. And I don't think it's the police that show that care. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Derek, uh, comments on that as well? Well, I, you know, I think that DC is this sort of creates this conundrum for people who are, who are dealing with issues of police reform. I and mean, if you look at the city's history, it was one of the first major cities in the United States to have a black police chief. It had a very aggressive affirmative action program. Uh, and it made it, you know, was able to create a, a majority black uh, brass within the police department relatively quickly. Uh, and, you know, had a large number of black officers uh, by the time that Marion Barry is pushing into his, his second term. Um, and yet, you know, it's, it's right around that time uh, that you start to get the police force being tremendously violent. Uh, and locking up, in, in certain cases, a whole generation of young Black people. And that's, of course, the, because the, the, the integration of the, the force uh, coincided with the, the crack epidemic. And, and then, of course, we became the murder capital of the United States uh, starting in 1988. Um, and, you know, to add, to, add to it, uh, you know, Congress meddles in our domestic affairs. And so in 1989, Congress forced the city to hire 1,500 new officers. And folks in the city said, look, we're not capable of training them on the timetable that you've given us. And Congress said, we don't care. Uh, and so what you essentially had was 1,500 new officers come onto the force in 1989, 1990. 
and they became the deadliest officers in the history of the department. By, by the mid-1990s, D.C. was uh, the top city in the nation per capita for killing its own citizens, uh, for the police killing their own citizens, shooting their own citizens. Um, so much so that the police chief in, I think it was 2000, uh, actually asked the Justice Department to come and do an investigation and enter into a uh, consent decree with the federal government so they could, he could essentially clean up the department. Um, and so, so you know, we, we've had a very tumultuous history that, that um, defies the easy char characterization that we, we sometimes graft onto uh, police black community violence in other cities, right? It's a majority white force. It's, it's you know, it's extracting um, resources from black community, community done deal. Here, that's not as, as easily understood. And I think that what we really have to, to get at is sort of the volume uh, of policing that happens in certain neighborhoods. You know, James Foreman Jr. in his wonderful book, Locking Up Our Own, uh, states in just one little section, he says, you know, I, I knew a guy who worked at Oak Hill, which was used to be DC's uh, youth reformatory. So I knew a guy that worked there for 10 years and he never saw a white kid at Oak Hill never in 10 years. Um, I mean, that speaks to a certain level of targeted enforcement that doesn't, um, you know, that, that doesn't account for the racial diversity of the city, even if you're talking about the 1990s, right, or the 1980s. I mean, there was still like 20, 30 percent white population in the city at the time. You're telling me none of them uh, uh, violated um, uh, the law. Um, and so, you know, I think that we haven't been, you know, real honest about the ways that we're using the police particularly against young poor people in this city. And because the, the city hasn't had an appreciably significant poor population of white people roughly since the 1960s and 70s, that means we're talking about poor people of color. Uh, and those are the folks that end up in Oak Hill. Those are the folks who end up in the federal system doing time in West Virginia or North Carolina or Montana or Alabama. Um, and those are the folks who come back into uh, a reentry system it doesn't really kick in until they actually get back into the city, which is probably too late to help them, you know, readjust to society. Again, like I and said, there, oh, oh, no, 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 no. I just wanted to just, please, just, please. just wanted to jump in and just state, you know, today marks the 35th anniversary uh, of the Anti-Drug Abuse Act, um, which uh, established, and Joe Biden was one of the authors of this, uh, that established the um, 100 to 1 uh, disparity between crack cocaine and powder cocaine, which we know, um, you know, escalated the federal prison population. And then also uh, nationally, because it impacted a lot of what states started to do around crack. And so, um, you know, in, in DC, I think is uh, emblematic of like the real impact of that. Like what we're talking about now around displacement and gentrification, family destabilization, the issues within the schools, um, as Derek pointed out, it's very tied to that time, right? And I think we we just cannot miss that, right? It's, it's like, this is this is the collateral damage of those times and of policies like that. And even as he mentioned, what was going on on the police force, a lot of that was veiled or justified based on uh, how out of control people said the city was and certain communities were, right? Um, and those are the communities, that's the, that's the environment that, that I grew up in, like literally, right? So I know that in real time and my father being in prison now 32 years, um, you know, still serving a life sentence based on like literally this policy or this legislation. So I just wanted to throw that in there for, especially for the audience to understand that, that we're not just talking about things that are like up in the air. This is like real, like these are real things that I that have, impacted people's lives um and and I, i'm a, i've been covered right i'm a luck i'm one of the lucky ones if you will uh but like my peers not so much like like literally you know people in our age group from this city um are far and few between as, as it relates to those that quote unquote just have a normal life whatever that looks like right but like like just go to work every day like we our, our generation got ravaged like crushed uh, by by these policies and everything that was you know spawned as a, as it relates as a, as it relates to them. No, um, thank you, thank you, Tony and Sharice. I see your hand. We got 
we're, we're getting close to time. So I want to get one more question out. I don't, and while I get this question out for anyone that's watching, viewing, if you have a questions, please put them in, in the Q and A. Otherwise I'm going to keep this conversation flowing. Uh, one thing I want to ask, um, kind of change, kind of redirect again to gentrification. NDC, Sharice and Tony, I think you both talked about this and, you know, we talked about the fact that, you know, um, there's this very stark and real wealth gap, racial gap in the District of Columbia, something that we all know, we can't hide from it, got to recognize it. Um, you know, and right now, currently, we have a lot of students, we have a lot of um, residents in DC that are living, white residents that are moving in, you know, live, moving to communities that they, you know, 10, 20 plus years ago, they would not have. Right, but they're there now. You know, Car Congress Heights, um, Trinidad, Ivy City. You know, just all over. You know, and so I think there's some pros and cons to this. And so I I want you all to 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 talk about. You know, if you believe this is more of a pro, you more of a con. You know, you have newer white residents living with older black residents. As I go on, as I go around the city and the ward, I see this, and I also see. I think Tony, me and you and Sharice, we've had these conversations once or twice, bike lanes, right? You know, there's an article recently where see bike lanes, bike lanes is the new big controversy all over the District of Columbia. For the audience, if you don't know, now you know that bike lanes is a real controversy. So, you know, I wanted to talk about, you know, whiter, newer residents living with older black residents and having conversations around things such as bike lanes. So, um, Sharice, I, I know that I, I stopped you from speaking earlier, so I want to give you an opportunity to, to answer this first, and then anyone else that has some thoughts around this topic. Yeah, so let me first say I'm a, I am an avid biker. Uh, back in the day, we rode our bikes from Congress Park to Circle Quarters quite regularly. Uh, only my bike didn't have the the seat and my best friend's bike didn't have brakes. So biking DC is not new to me. Uh, we, we've done this before. Um, I think what started to change was we saw entire blocks, parking spaces just being removed and replaced with bike lanes. Whereas in other parts, we saw bike lanes come up where they were next to the parking spots. So for, whatever reason, and in some of these communities, I know in Ward 5, we, I joined you over there, um, they could not understand why they were not receiving a prior notice, what would make them decide that their block was just, was not worthy of parking spaces. Um, and, and it's about being organized and putting your money where your mouth is. So that's what's happening. Every movement happens like this. And I'm gonna be clear, Malcolm X said this, we're not outnumbered in any cause. We're out organized. And what the bike coalition decided to do, they were going to put their money up. They were going to have the, the policies and regulations written to their standard. And they were going to enforce those laws and enforce those positions. And so that is the power that students listening right now have on any issue. You know, I encourage you to join us. If you want to work on this issue seriously and you say, you know what, we see what's happening. We want to put protections in place for people who can't afford to live here so that we don't see more homeless encampments coming up on the side of the road. So people are not being robbed, trying to carry their grocery stores and baby are from down the street and around the corner to get to their front door because they no longer have a parking spot. You can be a part of that change. And it's not it's only that we invite you to join us in creating those policy changes because that's what ends up happening. You're, you're, you're parking two blocks away. You're trying to, you know, you're now competing with the whole city for parking spaces. You just had a new baby or you're trying to have a new family. Then you're bringing in groceries because your whatever delivery service didn't make it to your front door. But now you're faced with a new public safety issue that we have not deeply addressed because we don't wanna deeply address the systemic issues that impact our city. We just wanna build on top of it. And those things, we see don't work well together and they haven't worked well together. And so again, what these entities are doing, they're deciding what's best for their interest. And as a biker, I like bike lanes and I like to be safe on the road. But as someone who supports the disability community, someone who carries in wheelchairs in my car 
and supports my mom with her home health aid services, it's unfeasible to think that people can live in the city without access to proximity parking. And so I'm gonna turn it back over to you. I had a little bit more to say on the last subject and hopefully we'll get time to come in and talk about the um, police and the schools. I know you've moved right along now. Yes, yes, I was trying to move the conversation along and you know, it's good that sometimes you don't get everything out on the first one. It kind of sets it up properly for the next uh, event, hopefully. So um, if we have some time, definitely come back to that, Sharice. But I want to hear yeah. other thoughts. And we have two questions in the chat, too. So I want to try and see if we can get to them in the next couple of minutes. But I want to hear other thoughts on this topic uh, first. Anyone else? Any, any thoughts or comments? Derek, please. Yes. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm like, um, I'm like Sharice, I like bike lanes because I've been riding downtown. I'm not trying to die. Right. Uh, so I want to start with that. Um, what, what I think bike lanes are, though, are, are a symbol of this larger issue that we're dealing with. Right. I mean, we have to remember, you know, and this is for the students primarily that gentrification is a, is a very specific term created by Ruth Glass, who in her study of London in the 1960s, and it kind of travels across the Atlantic uh, to be used by American social scientists in the mid 1970s, right? Back, back before the 70s, we used to call what we now call gentrification, private revitalization in Washington, DC, because we've had gentrification in the city since the 20s. Uh, we just called it something else. Um, and what Ruth Glass says about gentrification is that it is the gentry moving into areas where the poor predominated, right? And then pushing them out. Right, so it's a very specific process, and I think what what's key to understanding, uh, you know, sort of how gentrification is affecting us and what to do about it, is to fall back on that that very specifically economic explanation, right? Because in London, you don't you don't have discussion of race because like pretty much everybody being coming in and being displaced is predominantly white, right? I mean, there's there's a large you know population of people of different racial backgrounds in London, but what she was talking about was white folks on each side. Um, and I think when we, when we talk about DC, we have to remember that like, this is part of a capitalist economy where some of the prime movers in gentrification are realtors and developers, right? Working with city uh, officials. And what they're trying to figure out is how to buy low and sell high. That's the deal, right? That's what's happening. Um, you buy low in areas that were traditionally depressed, that were tr traditionally underdeveloped by the city and by the real estate industry. And so that means the old centers of the African-American ghetto, of the Latino ghetto. That means Adams Morgan. That means Columbia Heights, Shaw, right? I mean, the center of gentrification in contemporary DC is 14th Street below you and down to Thomas Circle. Well, that used to be the stroll, right? Like I wasn't walking up and down 14th Street at 10 o'clock at night on a weekend. That's where the hookers were, right? Um, and so now it's bars and restaurants and condos, you know, and that's because people could go in there, sit on a property if they bought low, and then sell exceedingly high, right? Um, and so I, I think we have to be specific about what's going on. Nobody's going to be gentrifying, um, you know, Manor Park in the same way. You can't, you, it, it never got low enough, right, as, as far as like being able to really suck profits out of it. The reason people are starting to go out to Deanwood and, and Manor Park to, to flip houses now is because all the cheap properties in the center city have, have been tapped out. Um, and so, so, so there's an economic side to it I think we, we have to keep before us. No, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, any other comments before? Just want to get to the two questions in the chat, then we're going to close up. Any other comments on this? Okay, great. Um, so the first question uh, in, the, in, the ch in the q and A is, how does DC move forward in making the city more inclusive for returning citizens socially, culturally, politically, and economically? How can gentrification benefit the reentry community and their families? What needs to happen to make this possible across race and class divisions? Just anyone could just opine and just speak up. I just, I like to start, I know Tony, this is your lane, so I, I will yield this to you very quickly. Uh, my first thought on this, when I found out that returning citizens were not at minimum, ensured they had a driver's license or some type of identification upon leaving the prison system, uh, that is in itself criminal. 
Um, and I know Tony has extensively worked on this subject matter, but that's something that I thought was probably one of the, the most significant things that you could do is to make sure that they have the proper documentation that they need to show up in any room to say, hey, I returned home. Um, and I think that you know at least 30 days out before someone's returning that you have to get their documentation in place. So that should not be upon them to go to stand in the DMV line to do so. Um, and so I'm gonna pass this one over to you, Tony. Oh, we look, there we go, okay. I'm here, I'm here, sorry. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, I kind of alluded to it earlier, but I definitely think that it needs to be that allows that when the judge gives somebody uh, a safe return with a clean state. I mean, really ultimately that would be the goal. Um, and therefore, uh, the same opportunities that are afforded to every citizen will be uh, afforded to them for they will be seen as a citizen. You know, we got to move time. Uh, if you're in, if you're in community, you are a citizen and you deserve to be able to uh, have the right of, of every other citizen. That's uh, that oh, we uh, I think, get I think to a place. Me. I think, I think, oh, I'm sorry. I don't. Well, I I don't know. Y'all couldn't hear me. Oh, I, that what I just said was good. So you can hear. Me. Okay, <laughs> I defer. I'll... Okay, okay. Well, all right. We're, we're, it was good from what I was saying. It was good, but yeah. So with a couple minutes left, because it's four o two, I want to get to this other questions. Um, it's real quick. Is what will motivate uh, DC voters of color? to go to the polls and use the power of their vote to push back on gentrification policy and practices. Okay. The right yeah. candidates. Right, 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 right. Simply put, um, another quote, the, the final one here, and I think this one, I would like everyone, you know, if you have some comments on, and we'll close up here. Um, I'm a, this is from Maxine Davis. How you doing, Maxine? Uh, I'm a 2016 alum of AU and native of DC. I've always provided what felt this unique experience of what it was like to live in DC in relationship to policy, uh, to policy of discussion, and it was always a heavy lift. Can you share some, some action items with the audience on what can be done next to continue learning and correct these wrongs? Uh, okay, we're, we're gonna go with Derek and then Sharice. Uh so, so, you know, I'll, I'll sort of go in and, and follow up on, on what Tony said about the right candidates to, to bring people out. I mean, one thing I think that we have to be attentive to when it comes to Black people voting in D.C., so we talk about the Black community coming out to vote, is that class politics plays a huge role within the, the Black community in Washington, D.C. I mean, you know, you look at Marion Barry's 1994 campaign where he made voter registration east of the river a central component of his campaign. Um, literally was at the center of his campaign. Like that was one of the most important aspects of it. And he put together a pitch that was, that was perfectly attuned to working class and poor DC residents. He had people like Roach Brown on his staff working with uh, folks who, who had come out of uh, jail and prison. I mean, he was, he was focusing on, on the, the, the poor half of, of Black DC. And what he does in that election is that through those policies, he essentially gets Black voter registration in Ward 8 to basically go even with Ward 3. And Black voter turnout in Ward 8 goes even with Ward 3. That never happens. That never happens in the home rule period, right? Mm. But people in those wards were animated by that candidate. They believed that he honestly represented to them. He was speaking to them and he was talking about policies that they honestly believe would make a change in their life. So they got up, they got out and they voted, right? Now you go back to the last election where Muriel Bowser was up for re-election um, or last election where Trayon White was up for re-election. And you're talking about 10, 20% turnout in Ward 8. Um, What's happening there? I mean, one is that those candidates aren't doing good voter registration or mobilization. So that's a campaign issue, right? Um, but the other is that they're speaking to a very specific middle-class politics. If you talk about the green team is the dominant political coalition 
in DC. I mean, that's a black political coalition. It's got a lot of white developers in it, but it's a black political coalition, right? Um, and the fact of the matter is they're speaking to the, a lot of needs of people who live in my neighborhood, right? Because I live up here near the mayor in Shepherd Park. Um, you know, and we're getting a lot of stuff we want from the green team, right? But people in other parts of the city that don't have the same economic profile as, as folks in my neighborhood aren't getting what they want from the green team. And they just don't feel like, um, you know, there's anybody on the ballot that's really going to talk to their needs. So they don't show up. And I mean, you saw those embarrassingly low levels of turnout because of that. Um, you know, you can say to those people, well, you need to get to the polls, but, you know, they can say right back to those elected officials, give me a reason. Right. Right. Well, well stated. Well stated. <laughs> As somebody who's dealt with some with voters and elections, I, I, everything you're saying is, is spot on, Derek. Um, Sharice, is there anything you want to add to that or can, can we uh, close up? Yeah, I, you know, to your point, and I was looking at some images where we were knocking on doors uh, in one of your war five races, uh, Gordon, I think mobilizing voters. The first thing that I realized that I did not do in any other races was raise money. I'll start there. Um, I was the candidate who went in my own pocket. I was the advocate who funded every race I've ever run from the dollars that I earned and literally thought that that was going to be sufficient. Unfortunately, it is not. The current race that I'm in, you'll need about, I'll need about half a million dollars to compete in the race. Now ask yourself, why does anyone need that much amount of money to become a political candidate? That's because so much money has dominated public policy and public office that we, that those people who really are connected to the communities are furthest from the capital that they need to run an effective race, to get to the door of every resident. They said, Sharice, you're gonna to need to get to every DC resident at least three times. Again, it is it's not we're outnumbered, we're just out organized. We have to put our dollars behind the candidates that excite us. And we have to show up to put our, our energy, our time, our effort and all of those things to really mobilize a base and mobilize a city. And so again, I invite you guys to really, really pay attention to candidates that you like and want to engage in and actively support their campaign, not just in time, but making small contributions to ensure that the candidates who are close to the community have access to the ballot. Well stated. All right, we, we've, uh, thank you so much, Sharice. Uh, those are some true words as somebody that's again, been to some races where I've contributed money and also ha have asked to have folks donate money. You know, what you're saying is spot on. Um, so we are reached the end. Um, thank you all so much uh, for, you know, sharing some time. I know you all are very busy doing a lot of things, helping, serving, working on behalf of DC in a plethora of ways. Um, if, is there any last remarks, last comments anyone wants, wants to say? Uh, Parisa will look, is there anything you want to say to close out as we say goodbye this afternoon? I would just say um, read the books that are out there, Tony and, and Derek and other books um, that uh, t teach more about the history. Um, join an organization or, you know, support an organization. If you can't be directly involved, donate or, you know, do what you can to support. There's a lot of great efforts going on in the city. And you're if you're here as a student, even temporarily, um, I think it's the right thing to do to, to be informed about the community that you're living in and to support, especially the native Washingtonians in, in the things that they're fighting for. Thanks. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Any other closing remarks? I really love how Malcolm would say the ballot or the bullet. I think we are at the pivotal time in our life where we see the bullet seemingly to be more powerful than the ballot but it is simply not that way. It, you guys are a part of a, a change. You guys can be a part of a change that we can see more access to the ballot um, and less bullets. And that's something that's so, so very important to me um, when it comes to protecting vulnerable residents here, when it comes to ensuring that our returning citizens, both those returning from uh, incarceration and from prison, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, incarceration and from college. I think we don't talk about those returning citizens often enough like you guys will soon be. So I'm telling you now, the ballot is more powerful than the bullet. And looking forward to hearing you all's ideas and working on some policies with you. Awesome. 
well stated. Um, gentlemen, just want to make sure I give you the opportunity if you're good. I'll just say that, that don't forget to contribute and volunteer for Empower DC uh, uh, for the organizations that Tony works with. Uh, I know they're not going to rep their own organizations, but let's face it, we have to have a robust civil society that pushes our elected officials to address the needs of people who need housing, uh, who need a robust support system when they come out of uh, jail and prison. Uh, and these two people on the screen are doing that work and we need to support them. I concur, I concur. Uh, Tony. I'm good, it's been an honor, it's been a pleasure, Derek. I appreciate that. Um, definitely uh, get out there, support organizations like Empire DC, DC or nothing. Um, get active in your own way. Uh, it's been, again, as always, an honor, Gordon, um, and I appreciate you. Thank you, everybody. Absolutely. And thank you, panelists. Uh, for me, somebody that is part of the AU community, it's really important for me to bring leaders and um, activists such as yourselves here to connect with members of the AU community so they can get a deeper understanding of what it is to really work and serve the District of Columbia proper. Um, so thank you all so much and thank you to our uh, audience and have a great rest of the day and stay safe everyone. Take care. Bye bye.